And then we can have five minutes Q&A or Q &A, yeah. two minutes Q&A at the end. I'll just close um, the door so we have the piece. Okay, so <coughs> let's go. So, um, very briefly, um, I started life as a designer, um, actually ironically an interior designer, then worked in the measured survey industry for a bit, always in a BIM and increasingly technology context, and um, last year started up on my own again um, uh, in a sort of digital construction consultancy role. I'm an engagement team member of Survey for BIM, if you've heard of that, that's one of the UK um, uh, BIM Alliance supporting groups. And I'm also, if you like your sailing, seeing as we're in Galway, I'm race director for Little Britain Challenge Cup, which is the biggest construction industry yacht racing event. Um, it's just past two uh, weeks ago. Um, so, automation is good, right? Yeah, of course it is. Um, well, it is. Um, but I don't think it's as simple as that. I think we need to um, look at um, why we should be automating, why we need to automate. Um, and uh, in this presentation, first I'm going to discuss the context for it. Um, I also think that there are a lot of things that um, many people get very excited about, even the people who use them. Um, but when you think about what, uh, how they automate pro uh, processes, really fall short of, um, of what uh, a good automation would be. Um, and then uh, once uh, I've talked about those, I'm going to end with a discussion of what we need to do to create an agenda for um, good quality automation in construction. So my starting point is two reports. Uh, the Pharma Review, has everybody heard of that? And the Hackett Review, Building a Safer Future. Um, heard of these? Yeah, yeah. So the Pharma Review is... Um, it's focused on who is working in the construction industry, how all this demographic is changing. We've got a um, problem particularly in the, in the UK, but I would imagine in all um, developed Western countries it's the same, of a reducing construction workforce. Many people who work in construction um, are old and near the age of retirement. Um, and at the same time, um, this issue of... Uh, um, how we upskill the industry to uh, deal with what is coming along, what approaches should technology and technology innovators take to support people. And then I'll juxtapose that next to the Hackett Review, which um, we've all heard of Grenfell Tower, um, terrible fire disaster last year, which 72 people lost their lives in. Um, there is no question that Grenfell represents a systematic failure of the way that we build, and I think that that is true across um, the Western world. Um, this may sound a little over dramatic, but from my perspective, the way we build is broken and out of control. Um, across the industry, competence is failing. Building systems, testing regimes are inadequate. Um, main contractors often don't know what was built and when. Um, and substitution is rarely tracked, and performance assessment of substitution is often subjective. Um, uh, it's very easy to say all of those things, and then everybody just go, yeah, I know, but that's like business as usual, isn't it? Until a tower burns down and 72 people die, and then we need to start getting more serious about it. These two reports have a real tension between them, because what Farmer describes is a shrinking workforce, an increasing workload um, and, uh, uh, and a drive to increase productivity, whereas Hackett demands more record keeping, more review, more scrutiny, something that is um, we would, in a business as usual approach to the world, we would associate with more people working in the industry, not less, as the statistics show us will be the case. Um, I think the interesting thing is Everybody I know who works in construction feels this, um, the stress and the pain of working on construction projects. You know, every day you don't get home to see your kids to bed or you wake up in the night with your head full of stuff um, or you don't have the thinking space to just work out how um, we're going to improve things. And that is all synonymous with this sort of pull between this, the, an, an industry which is increasing in the need for regulation and increasing uh, and reducing the number of people working in the industry. Um, and you know, the obvious uh, answer to this is we need automation. It's an essential part of the transformation of the industry. Um, I think we all know that many um, functions we perform in our day-to-day -day job are repetitive, um, 
um, not um, value generating, um, and, uh, and automation can help move that on. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, some mature technologies that we'll all be familiar with and some emerging technology um, that, uh, um, that purport to automate and, um, and I think most people would say um, are examples of good automation. So obviously measured survey automation is, um, you know, you've got all of the buzzwords, reality capture, more complete capture of building, speed, millions of points, democratisation of data, when democratisation gets into it, I immediately become highly sceptical. <coughs> um, and it's a, you know, we've got great hardware, um, there's some really good output from um, survey modelling. Um, but is it, is, it good or, is it good automation? Is it a good environment? Um, if you look at the industry, there's an awful lot of cheerleading around brands of hardware or software that people are using, um, rather than the functionality and effectiveness of things. So the pros and cons, let's weigh them up. Um, you've got massive data capture, that's great. We've got increasingly powerful hardware and software. But the, the problem with survey, and I've, you know, I've done my fair share of laser scanning, um, you've got loan working, you've got equipment theft, um, you've got boredom and loneliness whilst people are working. You can be on your own for an entire day in a building just walking around moving a laser scanner. Um, and that, I think, it's reasonable to say that's leading to mental health issues if it hasn't already. Um, why is this? Um, <clears throat> so I would say this is, I'd characterise this as an unfinished automation, uh, automation and I'll call this basic failure number <coughs> one. It's technology that performs a task very efficiently but creates new, often lower skilled or tedious tasks surrounding itself to, function, uh, to facilitate its functioning. Um, that's exactly what laser scanning does. I mean basically if you've done any laser scanning, the thing you do is you move the scanner and press the button. Um, and you're kind of thinking about how the overlaps might work, but that's about as far as it goes. The next thing, uh, document portals, the extranet revolution. Um, it's great, isn't it? I mean, we can get access to all of this information. Um, uh, we've started to get buzzwords like the single source of truth, um, which kind of conflicts with the idea of a federated model, but uh, hey, we're all using it anyway. Um, you've got uh, these portals, you've got access control. The interesting thing is um, I'd almost extend this to, um, to the idea of, um, of BIM models because BIM, even though we're in the no BIM room, apologies, um, <laughs> BIM um, is a container of information. Um, so let's look at the pros and cons. Um, obviously project data in one location, um, an enforcement of some standards and conventions with pretty good security control, fairly transparent security control, um, and paper trails for um, whether we're uh, whether people have read documents or not. But the disadvantages are there as well. You've got this data dump. What do you do when you receive a, a an automated email notification to say that somebody's uploaded 500 drawings on a Friday night at five o'clock, and it's your job to understand what those drawings contain? Does a document control system do anything to help you do that? No. Um, and it's got, they've got poor tools for finding information. Um, most of the time, like many of our platforms in the industry, they're closed platforms, and so um, it's difficult to customise access to them, it's, uh, and uh, the data that is in the platforms isn't machine-readable. So again, not, not ideal. What I refer to this um, as it is the data deluge, and I call this basic failure too. Um, often technology appears to facilitate access to huge amounts of information, but then fails to provide tools to make the information tangible or understandable. You know, that's just making more work for you, um, even though it appears in the first instance that there's a good component to it. So automated design, which is amazing, and uh, I, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, I am a big fan of the work that is being done in this, but it's a long, long way from being finished um, for anything other than the most basic of work. Um, again, we've got the buzzwords, optimization, iteration, big data, AI and machine learning. We all want a bit of that, don't we? Yeah. So what um, are the pros and cons of, um, of automated design? Um, well, obviously we can iterate through many options. Um, we can consider uh, multiple factors, we've got rapid turnaround, um, slider-based prioritisation, it all seems pretty cool, doesn't it? 
Um, but actually, the process is very difficult to understand. How did the software get to the conclusion that it got to? Um, there's no explanation of re the result. Um, some platforms have some metrics, but again, it doesn't allow you to tweak and play. Um, and every platform that I've reviewed has a limited scope. Um, and uh, the problem with a limited scope is that that leaves the designer to work out all of the, the stuff that the software isn't helping with. Um, I'll pose this uh, idea that I think, in many ways, automated design is like, it's a bit like a talking dog. Um, it, it doesn't have any vocabulary to explain its reason, reasoning, and actually just having something say, it's optimal, it's optimal, it's optimal, it's optimal, you know, that's what my dog would say, it probably well, would say, can I go for a walk, can I go for a walk, can I have some dinner, can I have some dinner, that's why I'm glad it doesn't talk. Um, you can't, if you think about presenting a design to a client, as an architect who has designed a building, if you just said to them, well, there are these three options, they're all optimal, you choose one, you think the client's going to buy that? Of course they're not. They're going to say, well, why did you do it this way? How, does the, how do the spaces work? How does, yeah. The idea that a designer receiving a design from an automated piece of software um, and not being able to tweak and control and not being able to um, understand why the software has come to the conclusions that it has just makes it... Um, uh, not of no use, but of limited use. It's sort of optioneering thing. So, basic failure three, and this is, um, I would say, at the heart of most automations, um, there's a great idea. You know, optimised design, really interesting area to explore, um, but the problem is that developers are often so interested in the, in the, the technology bit of things, they forget to design the interface, they forget to, that they need to make something that is usable. Um, and from my perspective, obviously, actually the way that a piece of software interacts with its user is more important than what it does in many ways. Because if uh, other, you know, you can't use it if you can't interact with it. I'll pose this idea. Um, I think we're a cottage industry of automators. Um, every office has a dynamo guy in it. Um, you know, that's not a bad thing. Um, but when I hear um, conversations about where automation is being directed, um, I think there are a lot of unhealthy reasons for people wanting to automate. And this, the top one is, is probably my biggest. You know, People just have a bad um, attitude to um, roles that they don't necessarily understand. You know, automate the QS. I hate QSs. Automate them. Yeah? Um, uh, automate the sur uh, surveyor, surveyor out of things. Automate the design, which basically is... Uh, um, in a lot of people's eyes, is tantamount to remove the designer from, for, for, uh, from the equation. <coughs> We're bad at standards. Um, we think of big ideas only instead of, uh, of whole workflows. And often people work alone and claim um, intellectual property for really basic ideas, you know, stuff that is actually just good working practice. Um, also, if you look across the industry, particularly in design, you see that people repeat the same work over and over and over again. Um, and, you know, what would you prefer? An industry where you have a hundred versions of um, a tool to, I don't know, randomise cladding panels, um, or one really great tool for randomising uh, cladding panels, or three really great tools for cladding, uh, randomising cladding panels. I'd pose this idea that um, we should think of AI as something that should support professional decision making, not replace it. Um, I really like this guy, and I'd encourage you if, you, if you're interested in learning how your brain works, I would encourage you to read this book. You can actually download the PDF of it from the internet, so you don't even have to buy it. Um, but he makes this amazing statement. When the human brain finds a task it needs to solve, it rewires its own circuitry until it can accomplish a task with maximum efficiency, the task becomes burned into the machinery. I mean, that sounds pretty awesome. And actually, if you get into the sort of mechanics, you know, it's, it's the, um, the transition from trying to ride a bike and having to think about staying stable to your brain taking control of that process. Um, the brain is an incredibly efficient thing. Um, if you want an example of it, uh, when IBM's Deep Blue played Garry Kasparov during the, uh, the, game, uh, the games of chess, which he obviously eventually uh, was, uh, was beaten, 
Kasparov's body maintained normal temperature. Deep Blue was burning hot to the, hot to the touch, re required large collections of fans to dis uh, dissipate the heat, and a team of technicians to keep it working. Um, human brains run with incredible efficiency. Uh, so if you've sat up late at night trying to build a dynamo script that is trying to replace something the human brain does faster, better, more efficiently, then I would suggest you're on the wrong track. <clears throat> what we need to do is develop automation which supports people, not which tries to replace people, certainly in the first instance. Um, maybe when general uh, intelligence comes along um, in 30 years, well, they said it was going to be 30 years, 30 years ago, so maybe it won't be 30 years, but when general intelligence comes, maybe that, maybe that will be revisited, but um, for now, Focus on the things that support people. <clears throat> There's a common f feel that automation is going to take people's jobs. Um, this is another great quote from uh, Jamie Johnson. I don't know whether you know uh, Bryden Wood's work um, and some of the tools that they've created for automation, but I, I really like this, and it's, it, it tells us why we don't need to be worried. The amount we need to build over the next 30 years, which is predicted as... Um, as the UN thinks 2.5 billion more people will move to cities um, by 2050, um, while the ageing workforce dwindles, um, means that we can't possibly keep up the need to embrace uh, without embracing an appropriate level of automation in terms of design and construction. So no, auto automation isn't going to take your job. If anything, automation is going to make your job more interesting. Except it might take your job. This is, um, I have to say, I got this, I think, from Ralph. I first saw this uh, World, World Economic, uh, Economic Forum slide, and it's a really interesting one. When you look at uh, what they see as growing skills or growing in, uh, in need and declining in need, if you look at the stuff that's declining, an awful lot of that is stuff that we do in the construction industry. <coughs> it gives you a really good pointer for how people should be reskilling but I would say that it also gives you a good pointer for how uh, developers should be um, thinking as to what type of task they seek to automate. Now, you could argue that technology should seek to support skills that are growing in demand and replace skills that are declining in demand. Many auto automation projects, though, focus on replacing the growing skills, and others actively obstruct them for reasons I highlighted when I characterised the automation cottage industry. So, if we're to set an agenda for automation, um, what should it be? I would say first we need to consider um, what we should do first. Focus on the basic um, repetitive, um, low-hanging fruit uh, problems that could make the industry 30% more efficient, 50% more efficient. We need to think about changing skills and how we teach the built environment graduates the skills they will need for their working lives. So I, I think the industry is really bad at this. We're great at waxing lyrical about automation and all the technologies around it. But we're really, good, uh, really bad at actually saying what that means, how that should change what we teach people. Which human skills are valuable? Um, that's a, you know, the, the, uh, back to the World Economic Forum slide. You, know, you, you can see creative skills... Um, planning, person-to-person um, -person skills, um, all of these things are, um, are skills that can be supported by automation. Yeah, and uh, then finally I would say, is automation supporting or replacing a role that, need, uh, that involves the new skills we believe the industry needs? Because if it is, that seems like an odd place to direct your, uh, your energy. So as a last word, I will... Um, I'll tell you about an, there was an event that I went to quite recently, a Building Live event uh, in London, um, where we had five people from the industry, um, from the top of companies, two main contractors, a solicitor, a, um, an architect, um, uh, I think there was a journalist, I'm just trying to remember, um, maybe a housing consultant as well. Um, and um, they, they were all talking about technology in the industry. There was a lot of um, that really sort of juicy, high-level stuff that gets you excited, makes you want to whoop, that sort of thing. Now, at the end of the, uh, the uh, event, and in the Q&A, I asked a slightly mischievous question, which was, can you name one thing that you do in your professional, everyday job um, which 
uh, you could see um, being automated in the next five years. And also on the positive side, can you think of what that would allow you to do that you don't have time to do at this point in time? And what really interested, in, uh, interested me was the, the solicitor probably gave the best answer. Um, the architect gave a pretty good answer. Um, the housing consultant didn't really understand, I don't think, um, which was weird seeing he was, answer, he was talking about technology. And the two main contractors just talked about shortcomings of other people's jobs. Um, yeah, that is, that's a picture of the um, thought leaders, I hate that term, um, that's a picture of the thought leaders and how um, far they are away about thinking how this uh, technology is going to change their life. So, you know, we've got to do this. The biggest mistake you could make is to think this won't affect you. That's it. Thank you.